First Peter 3 verse 15, as you get there, just to say, it's nice to be together again and to be in the presence of God. It's not just together again because people could be together again with very other agendas. Let me not go there. But we are together again to refresh ourselves in the presence of God. Isn't that nice? And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, there is every good thing that we long for in life. And so as we come together again, it's a joy uh, to be here. I want to appreciate all those that have gone before me, Dr. Leo, uh, the worship team. Uh, thank you. The worship team already took it up and preached the sermon. Um, of course... Oh, beautiful. I've longed that I be uncoded and uh, thank God for my son, Americ. <laughs> he can read my heart. Thank you. I'm just appreciating those that have served before me. Uh, we are grateful, the ushers and everyone. I also want to appreciate uh, those that uh, were here last Sunday. Um, I was away on assignment with the Christian Union and I thank God for Richard Meruka who ministered and Reverend Wakaba, they served together. We are grateful. Uh, the pastors were various. Last Sunday, we had to call our retired pastor to come and help us and we are grateful for that teamwork. We are back, energized, revitalized for those who went for refreshing. Just to say that Pastor Dan is preaching in the CU, uh, taking over from where I left last Sunday, because IDC has a mission to this university. Please know that IDC, the reason we are not a domicile in some structure outside this compound is because we have a calling first to this university. So anytime you pray, remember to pray for the welfare of our Jerusalem. Praise God. Because the city where you are, liberty prospers, you also prosper with it. Amen. And so we desire the prosperity. Now you may wonder, how does your being here, uh, uh, be, how is this your Jerusalem and you live across the road? The other side of Juja Farm. You know, I, I want to just remind you that um, I've been around for a few days. And uh, the other day when we were in school, passing by the superhighway, uh, we could see the buildings here from Vika Road. There were no trees, there were no buildings. Juja is a product of J.K. Watt. Praise the Lord. You can ask Professor Maina when he joined here uh, those years. I mean, there were just two shops near the Kaflai over there. And that was Juja. The rest was just the university. The Juja, as we know, has come up because of this institution being here. And we thank God that through it, you have somewhere to live today. <laughs> because God has made Juja important. And so you found it worthwhile to be here. So let's pray for, for this place and um, let's trust God for welfare. Let's continue praying for the students. Thank you, Dr. Leo, for giving us a good exam. At least that exam we should have passed all of us. What do you think? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, that is an exam that we should all have passed. Um, and I pray that we'll all be like my co-worker, Susan who can be honest and say that she and an answer then she saw and she didn't want to what do you call it Ileuna copy <laughs> she refused to copy i appreciate that integrity keep at it amen first peter 3 verse 15 but set apart the messiah as lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope that is in you. I like the reputation of you. 
Uh, just verse 15. I would be referring to that passage from verse 10, but just allow me to dwell uh, on this verse. The first part say, set apart the Messiah. Some versions will say, set apart Christ as Lord. Others may use the word set apart Christ as King. And so as we uh, share the word today, and like I've said, the, the, the worship team already went ahead and most of the songs that we sang were about Christ being Lord, Christ being enthroned, Christ um, being worshipped. Uh, that was the emphasis. Why are we doing this? For us to realize an evident allegiance to God, the first thing is that we must have a willful commitment to God. Without a willful commitment, if our Christianity is the one to be coerced into a situation, uh, you know, I'm looking at the us here and the number of Bible studies that have been mentioned um, and wondering whether we shouldn't be having like 20 Bible studies. But you know, some of us are like wheelbarrows, they are to be pushed. And others are like trailers, they are to be pulled. Willful commitment is what delivers us so that the grace of God that makes his presence manifest in our lives can be experienced. The other practice that will help us experience the presence of God and our allegiance to God be evident is enthroning Christ as King. And so that is our topic today and it is actually the sub theme for the quarter, enthroning Christ as King. And that is um, what we want to talk about uh, for the next a couple of moments and we will pray. Enthroning Christ as king. What are we talking about? Enthroning is a verb. It comes from a noun that is drawn. The word drawn refers to a place or a position of authority. It is a seat of power or a seat of authority or a seat of dominion. If somebody says they have a drone and they have no power, then that is a fake drone. No wonder we have a lot of fake stuff nowadays. A drone must give authority to the one enthroned. So when we talk of enthroning, therefore, we are talking of endrone, uh, to enthrone, I said it's above, um, that means to crown or to install or to consecrate someone into that position of dominion, into that position of authority. When we install someone, an, a bishop is installed into a position of leadership in a church, a pastor is installed. We installed Pastor Dan here the other day so that he can operate in the office of a pastor. So, we can give authority and he will attend meetings outside IDC. Uh, my wife and I were coming here when we arrived in the morning. The announcements in the CU are pre-recorded and they were running. And the last announcement is the presentation of the speaker for the day and we overheard because the, it's on loudspeaker. And so um, it was a lady giving the announcement, of course it's pre-recorded, and she was saying, our speaker for today is Pastor Dan. Praise the Lord. Initially he has preached in the CU. He has not carried that title, isn't it? But today I heard from the walkway, and those who are with me overheard as it was going on. And he walks there as a pastor with authority from the throne where he was 
installed. Praise God. So we are talking of enthroning Christ. We are not just giving authority to someone else. We are giving authority to Christ in our hearts. The Bible says set apart. Uh, some version here says sanctify the Lord God in your heart. So we have to give authority to Christ in our hearts to be Lord. To be king. Allow me to again demystify the, the word king. Currently we have a king in one of the countries, is it uh, UK? Um, and somebody is called king and they are celebrated and they are given a lot of airtime and all that goes with that kingship. That is totally different from the kingship that is reflected in scripture and in the establishment of kingship. When the Bible talks of a king, please understand, it's not like King Charles. <laughs> totally. That is a king who is under the law. He cannot condemn anyone to hell. Neither can he uh, usher anyone to heaven. Even in his own country, he can't say kill that one. That kind of kingship is not what the Bible talks about. Hello? If I take you to a little walk into Daniel chapter 3, which is part of our reference for that quarter, when the king was enraged that the three Hebrew boys who are not bound to the golden image to worship it. The Bible says he gave instructions for the fire to be filled up and immediately he ordered them to be thrown into the fire. There was no case. There was no bondage to stand in and say these people have another religion there was no discussion throw them into the fire now <laughs> please take note the bible says the edict of the king was so urgent that the people who were throwing them into the fire were consumed by the fire and their death was inconsequential because it was in obedience to the king's edict. The king had given instruction. The collateral damage, those who are throwing them into the fire, they also become fuel to the fire. You don't realize what kingship meant. A king could say, kill that one. Bring that one to my table. And you are given honor. Just like that. You could be honored. You see. Daniel 3.22. Those who were taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were consumed by the fire. Themselves. And it was inconsequential. Kingship is a serious thing. And so, as we talk about enthroning Christ as king, I want us today to understand that it is not the kingship that we take lightly. It is a kingship that we take with seriousness. And allow me to start by saying um, the first thing, that Christ is already king. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, Christ is already king. Christ is God incarnate. In fact, one of the versions, I didn't check which version it was, that says, sanctify the Lord God as sanctify the, uh, the Lord as king. It's about it, it uses the, the word Lord God because Christ is the incarnate. Is God incarnate? Is God turned human? so that we can understand God. 
and for us to operate with better understanding. And that's why we encourage people to be part of Bible study. Praise the Lord. We cannot understand God unless we study his word. Because God has revealed himself in his word. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. As we read the word of God, we see the seriousness with which God takes sin. And then we are able to relate with that God with that understanding. That's why the whole scripture is important for us. And so I'm saying from Genesis to Revelation, Christ is presented as king because Christ is God. The Bible clearly tells us that uh, in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God, you know, he is the one who was in the beginning. It is him who created everything. And that is why Psalms 24 and verse 1 will tell us that um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and everything therein belongs to God. He is king. He is Lord over all things. It is not us who will make him king. He is king already. Praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, Christ was born to be king. If you read Matthew 2 verse 1, the Magi or the wise men from the east, when they were looking for Jesus, they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? But this is limiting, really. Well, but in the context, that is what people would have understood. He was born to be king. He was born king. So we are not making him king because he has no authority. Oh no. Ask Paul. Philippians chapter 2. Is it verse 10, 11 or thereabout? The Bible says actually a time is coming. Praise the Lord. When every knee will bow praise the lord and every tongue shall confess that christ is lord now whether you like it or not whether you belong to the jews or not so as we talk about enthroning christ i am trying to help us appreciate we are not enthroning him because he has not throne he is already on the throne praise the lord he rules. He is king already. Even when he came here on earth, we refer to Jesus as our savior. But please understand that Jesus came to introduce a kingdom because he was born king. Hallelujah. That is why in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, the Bible says, after he had been tempted now, Jesus started preaching. And what did he preach? Jesus went uh, about preaching the good news of the kingdom. He came to introduce a kingdom. And he says, the salvation that he brought to us According to Luke chapter 4 and verse 43, even the salvation is in the context of his kingdom business. Hallelujah. Because he says he must go and preach to other places as well. Why? Because this is the reason why he was sent. For this purpose, I was sent. For therefore I am sent. He was sent to do what? To preach the good news of the kingdom. And if you want to understand what he is talking about, you just need to retreat back to verse 18 and 19, where he says, The Spirit of the living God is upon me, for God has anointed me 
to preach good news. Praise the Lord. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are the components within which salvation is embedded because we have been captives of sin and we are object of wrath because of our sins. Jesus comes and sets us free from that condemnation and he ushers us to become members of the family of God. But that is not divorced so that we talk about salvation and forget that Jesus is about a kingdom. Hallelujah. That is a problem that is there today. That we have isolated salvation and so much focused on it and forgot that we need to have a king reigning over our hearts, reigning over our minds. This is the business for which he came. Hallelujah. I can't overemphasize than he did. He says, for this reason, I came. He was king before the earth was made. To help us understand, he was born king. At some point, he had a discourse with the, is it, uh, the high priest. In, uh, that should be Mark 14 and verse 61, 62, thereabout. And they are asking him, are you the son of God? Are you the promised Messiah? And of course he says he is. And in a moment they will see him coming down in the glory of heaven. Praise the Lord. Because he was born king. If you go down slightly, 15 verse 2, he tells Pilate, when Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews then? What did he respond? As you have said, you have said it, I am king. And so when we take this quarter to talk about enthroning Christ, we are not saying he is throneless. <laughs> he, he is not a king. I can assure you every tongue will confess and every knee will bow before him. But there is a reason why we are encouraging you to accept Christ. I think it is in Luke chapter 2 and verse 29 where he tells his disciples that I have a kingdom I received from my father. And my business here on earth is to confer, praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor Jesus wants to confer a kingdom to us. That is why we are looking unto enthroning him as king. Luke 22 and verse 29 I believe. And verse 30 he says, when he confers that kingdom to us, we will sit with him at the table, making judgment, that's verse 30, and the ruling, hallelujah, with him. It is at that point of rulership for those who have enthroned him that the miracles that we talk about are experienced. That is why we are talking about the need to enthrone Christ. Christ is already king. He rules. But he gives a chance that we may willingly submit instead of being coerced, instead of being forced. Praise the Lord. The second thing I want to bring across to us very quickly is the fact that um, we must willingly, individually, allow him to be Lord. Mm. 
you know, the, the passage you have read, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, the Bible says, Set apart Christ as Lord. Lord and the King, I have said, they have been used interchangeably. And those who understood lordship, I have always used the example of Lord Darmer. Even his grandson believed that he hails from the lordship. And so when he meets a black like you, he can just shoot you. And a few years back, in a period of like two years, you would find someone hunting and just decide to hunt you also. Just like that. Before he was reminded that Kenya is now independent. And other things took over. We must individually enthrone Christ as king. The passage we have read tells us that setting apart Christ as Lord and when you look at the context I talked of verse 10 down all the way to um, verse 18 down there it is giving us a picture of what it means it's about leverencing Christ let Christ be the one you fear most I have already set the picture of who a king is. And if that is surely who a king is, then when the Bible says set apart Christ as king, then we are saying let him be the one you fear most, the one you dread most. I mean, if you are a young lady, it's not to be left by your boyfriend. If you are a young man, it's not to be left by your girlfriend. That's not who you dread most. It's not to lose your job for you who is employed. Hmm? For you who is in marriage, it's not about losing your mind. The one you dread most is Christ because if you dishonor him, he has the capacity to throw you to hell. The others can only harm the body. And I'll keep referring to Daniel chapter 3. This guy say, Live long, the king. We don't have to defend ourselves concerning this matter because the God we believe in is able to deliver us and he will. But please also note, because of how we reverence him, because of who he is, even if he does not deliver us, hallelujah, we are willing to become fuel to the fire. That is why down there others were consumed by that fire as they drew these fellows into the fire. We are talking about just wanting to sincerely and fervently adore him. He is supreme. When we say set apart Christ, it's where you adore him. You esteem him above all. Our thoughts of him are with reverence. You respect him. As a matter of fact, one of the kings of old was told, you know even what you say in your bedroom. <laughs> This man, is it Elijah or Elisha? He can know what you say in your bedroom and he will tell his king and so you can't have a secret before this God. People who reverenced him like Joseph, there are two of them in the house with Potiphar's wife. Praise the Lord. But you know Joseph and set apart God as Lord. Amen. When God is Lord, when Christ is King, it doesn't matter if you are alone. That is what Daniel missed at some point. 
not Daniel, David. David and uh, Bathsheba. That story, the only thing that David lost is that God is not in the battle. God is everywhere. Joseph, knowing that, says, how can I do such an awful thing before my God? Why? Because for him, although in Egypt, where seemingly nobody else knows the God of Israel, to Joseph, wherever he was, God was. Hallelujah. And when we talk about enthroning Christ, that is what we are talking about. That even when you are in the belly of the fish, hallelujah, Jonah raised a prayer to God. Because in the downest moment, if there's a word like that, we can reinvent English. Even in the downest moment, Jonah knew that God, there is nothing beyond rescue. Hallelujah. And was Jonah rescued? It doesn't matter the depth you have sunk. Our God, because he is king over all. In fact, in Philippians um, 2, verse 11, when he says, every knee shall bow of everything in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Praise the Lord. Yes, verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth, even under the earth, where Jonah for that moment was, we are saying, we have a king who can reach you where you are. Who can be with you up there where you say, as you ascend in leadership, it is cold up there. You have no companionship. Hello, our king can be with you there. Because it doesn't matter whether you are in heaven or you are on earth here or you are below. Wherever it is, he is king. Hallelujah. So we, we reverence him. We hold him with fear. We rely on his power. We trust his faithfulness. And we submit to his wisdom. It is important that setting him apart as king has to take into consideration that if we have anything beyond us, we will rely on his power. If the circumstances are shaky, we will trust his faithfulness. And if there are things we don't understand, my friend, we will submit to his wisdom and not choose to do things our own way. We are talking about individually setting him on the throne. And so he tells the people in First Peter, the passage where these words are directly used. From verse 10, he talks of, you know, he takes time to say how people should relate at family. Then he comes up there and he says how people should relate with one another. You know, they should tame their tongues and avoid every careless talk. He goes ahead in verse 12 and tells them, you know, the reason this is important is because when you enthrone him, his eyes are on you. Again, here he is quoting Chronicles. And the Bible says, The eyes of the Lord move back and forth, looking for the righteous, that he may strengthen them. Here he says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their request. So if you enthrone him, then you are able to enjoy this help. He is continually with you. Praise God. And that is why it's important to understand. That is why he didn't just want people to think about future. He wanted them to know you can enjoy the kingdom right here on earth. And even when he sent his disciples to preach. 
By the way, I realized as I prepared, some things started ending up. That in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus was sending his disciples for their first mission ever, he didn't tell them, go and preach salvation so that people can be ready for future. Hallelujah. He told them to go and preach the kingdom of God. That should be verse 2. Um, he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God. I mean, it was about the kingdom. And that is why we must appreciate his kingship. Because that was his agenda. And when we take him according to his agenda, it becomes easy. Praise the Lord. It becomes easy for us. Will we set apart Christ that he may be Lord, that we may totally depend on him and believe that there is nothing we can do on our own that is better. Setting Christ apart as king, uh, the same look, verse 23, Jesus told his disciples, or the people who are listening to him, if anyone want to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I want you to take note of the word daily. Take up the cross. What was the purpose of the cross? Crucifixion. Jesus is saying, to enthrone me, you have to be ready to die daily. It's a commitment that you submit to continually. It's a commitment that says, I love my life not. That is what Daniel demonstrated when he decided, let me be food to the lions rather than be unfaithful to my king. That is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saying. If anyone want to come with me, he must, he or she must deny himself. You must be ready to say no to your fears, to your aspirations that are contrary to the will of God and to anything that is not in line with the purposes of God. Friends, to enthrone Christ means that nothing else that we can value above God. That's basically what it means. In Matthew, Matthew 13, and verse 44, Jesus preaching about the kingdom because it's important that people understand why Jesus came. You know, he said explicitly, this is not an interpretation, it is him saying explicitly that the reason he came is to bring the kingdom. I'm told even when he taught them how to pray, what did he tell them? The, king, the kingdom that will come in the future? He told them in your prayer, pray that thy kingdom come. It's about the kingdom being here present and being experienced by us. So in Matthew 13, 44, he says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in the field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy he goes and sells everything. Underline the word, everything. Enthroning Christ is treasuring relationship with him as superior to anything you 
you love, including your own body, including your newest shoe, that you are hoping that before you walk from here today, we will see it. Yeah? I mean, why buy that nice shoe and come in it and nobody sees it, honestly? It's not fair. And throning Christ is superior to that. Someone saw and sold everything. To have Christ as king. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like. I mean, to belong to this kingdom is like there is nothing else that matters but your king. Praise God. That's why Paul, understanding this, writing to the Galatians in Galatians 2, and verse 20, he says, I no longer live. Friends, <laughs> I don't live. The life I live in the body, I live in the name of the Son of God who died for me. So I'm equally dead except for him. That if I live, it is him living through me. Praise God. When you understand this, then we are good to close this service and go home. Because of that, let me say the last thing. And thrown in Christ. What did we say? The first thing, Christ is already king and he rules over everything. Number two, we have said, we must enthrone him individually. I've just belabored what enthroning him entails. And lastly, I'm saying, enthroning Christ gives us access to the grace of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Enthroning Christ gives us access to the grace of that kingdom. Many of us desire that the evidence that Daniel exhibited would be our portion, that testimony, that God would fight for you, that God would reveal this or the other for you. We, we desire that, we long for that. Allow me to say that it is possible, even today, Hallelujah. It is possible even today because like I've mentioned from, from Luke chapter 22 and verse 29, it is the Father's will that we receive the kingdom from his son. Actually, the words now I'm using, I'm mixing with the John version. The John version always says, it's the Father's will to give you the kingdom. Praise God. That you may operate in the power. And that's why I've said when Jesus was sending out his disciples in Matthew 28 and verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Hallelujah. He is releasing them with the authority that he has received. When he was sending his disciples in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, the Bible says he sent them two by two and he told them that I give you authority. Hallelujah. I give you authority to trample over snakes, over scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. Praise God. He wants us to be partakers of the grace of the kingdom. The power that there is in the kingdom. And friends, as we conclude this service, I want us to know that if nothing else, you can demonstrate that power in yourself. In Mark chapter 16, from verse 15 there, he tells his disciples to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom to all creation. Then verse 17 he says, 
And this evidence will follow those who believe. Praise God. Generally, it is, it is not just the apostle. It's not the pastor. It is not the leader. The Bible says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Hallelujah. Then this grace is yours. And how to activate it? I have already said, brethren, it is putting the Lord on the throne. He is the God of power. He is the God of majesty. He is the one on the throne. He told those who were about to put him on the cross as he talked to them in Mark 14 and 60, uh, verse 61 and 62 that this one that you are bowed this moment, this one that is in the body of weakness today, you will see him coming down in power, in authority. And therefore our weakness does not mean the authority of the kingdom is not with us. But when it pleases God to show that his power is with us, he will make it come to pass. But the wisdom of the kingdom says, even if you don't deliver me, God, I will die believing. Is it Job who had enthroned God as Lord and King? He says, I'm um, forgetting the chapter, is it chapter 13 or somewhere? He says, even if the Lord slays me, even if he himself slays me, I will trust in him. Praise God. I will trust in his wisdom. I will trust in his power. Hallelujah. That is Job 13 verse 15. Would you want to trust him today? Would you want to walk in the grace of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Would you want to walk with that evidence like Daniel that God is with you? Would you want to be like Joseph that even when you are in prison for the wrong reasons, just for standing upright, you find yourself in prison? Will you believe that God is able to be with you there and vindicate you and lift you up that those who hated you, like his own brothers, can later come and bow before him. Do you desire that? And then you are living for yourself? I call you today that we may enthrone Christ. And to 